So uh, this part today is all about a burning bush. Yep, like that's what the story is. It's a story of the burning bush. And I shared earlier, I think around the first week, that we're going to go from maybe some more obscure parts of Moses' calling to this part, which is a little bit more famous, at least famous enough to have uh, it in a movie scene. This is the Ten Commandments. Uh, But for as famous a story as it is, it's pretty odd, right? Like Moses encounters agriculture. And somehow, like, that becomes, like, the thing, like, the story. But in other ways, it's just one of the very strange things that have been going on in Moses' life. Like, have you noticed that? Like, the whole story is pretty strange. So let me just back up and tell you uh, what's been going on, in case you have uh, missed it, and in case you just want to hear it again. You know, we started before Moses was even born with midwives uh, that actually were helping uh, new babies, new life come into the community until there was an order from the Pharaoh that said, you know what, no more male babies. You've got to kill them all. And these midwives decided to fear God instead of fearing Pharaoh. And they said, we're going to change that up. We're, we're not doing that. That's not what's going on. And these women actually changed the course of history. Now Pharaoh tried to kind of sneak in some other things, do some other stuff, Uh, And this time it was other women that came in to rescue. Moses' mom, Moses' sister, Pharaoh's daughter, all women that said, we're going to save this baby. We're going to protect this baby. And it was literally Moses' cry that let the Pharaoh's daughter hear Moses and say, this is a baby, a child I want to rescue. And Moses grew up in the Egyptian court. That might seem like it's the end of the story, right? It seems like this nice good story of rescue. But the story continues from there. Moses one day sees uh, something going on in the community. He sees an Egyptian oppressing these two Hebrews, which wouldn't have been an uh, you know, unordinary sight. It's something that uh, for Moses, he saw probably every day, the oppression of his people. But for whatever reason, that day, something kind of went off for him. Maybe you guys have had this day where you just see something, you're like, no, 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 not anymore. I'm not going to deal with that anymore. And he decided to confront this Egyptian and ultimately to kill him. That led him to be on a journey of not one failure, uh, but there was a second trying to interrupt and kind of get in an argument with uh, his own people and then eventually leaving town because the Pharaoh had a hit for his life. And he went to the wilderness. In this wilderness, he found a priest, a person that was actually connected to his story of God, his family lineage, lineage through Abraham. And in that place, Moses set up a home, almost like a second home. But if you remember the last line from last week, he named his son something that meant a foreigner in a foreign land. Even though he was getting comfortable in the wilderness, finding a wife and a family in the wilderness, he still knew this wasn't home. This wasn't where he should be. That's where we're picking up today. It's a crazy story, a strange story. And even though we're picking up on one of the more famous parts today, uh, I think I have a conviction about all the strangeness in the Moses story. It's this, that Moses' story has something to do with your own. That Moses' story, the story of resistance and rescue, conflict and call, and even wilderness, has something to do with your story. Because I think you probably have been through those moments are going through those moments, or maybe will go through those moments. And it all comes to a head today. The story uh, that Moses is living into. And last week I also gave you guys a a worksheet that had a a few questions you could use and a few prompts to think more about your own story. Now, for Moses, the way he'd fill this out is something like this. You know, context of your people. Well, you know, promised much by an ancient god. People currently enslaved, though family story, Hebrew birth mom, birth siblings, raised with an Egyptian family, trained to be an Egyptian elite, motivation, he wants to help his people, and then the conflict, well, when I tried to help, I killed someone, I started an inter-ethnic conflict, then I fled because I had a hit on my life from my own royal family. You know, maybe yours is a little bit less complicated than that, or maybe it was more complicated, I don't don't know your life like that. That's something of how he would fill out that worksheet. But if you might ask, like, what about those questions on the right side? Uh, that are super dim here, but they're dim for a reason. Where has God met you, given that who is God to you? What mission does God have you on? Well, 
there's kind of something that I've been thinking about through this whole series. It's kind of been an uncomfortable thought for me, because I'm like, is this true? Like, what's going on? Like, it's the question, does Moses really know God? Like, does Moses know God at all? Like, is he a worshiper of God? And I realized week in and week out as we've looked at the text closely, I don't think so. Like, God's mentioned two times in these first two chapters. Once, it's a reference with the midwives. I think we can just admit, like, the midwives just rock. Like, they're just amazing characters in the story. They're actually fearing God. Like, they have a relationship with God. They're like, no, we're going to fear God, not the Pharaoh. Like, A plus to them. They're doing well. And then the other reference for God is just saying the groaning of the people is something God hears. But those references are never with Moses. Never with Moses' worship, Moses' prayer, Moses' story. It's never connected. We can see the fingerprints of God in Moses' life, I think, through the work of the Holy Spirit. But I don't think Moses saw it himself. I'm not even sure how aware Moses was of God. Remember, the last thing we saw was him being fairly impulsive, making bad choices, and just moving on. Not even asking for forgiveness or repenting, and certainly not doing what God has called him to do. I think at this point, it'd be fair to look at Moses' faith and his commitments, his spiritual background. We know he's alive because of these midwives. We know he's alive because of God's work in his life. But we can also maybe assume that Moses explored, like, other Egyptian gods. Like, that's how he was raised. It's where he was raised. Maybe... Uh, He was a little bit more familiar with the God of Israel through his time in the wilderness, but it doesn't really seem to be that important to him. Maybe Moses is something more like a nominal God follower. Like he knows like that's the story of his people, but not necessarily his personal story. Maybe some of us in the room have been there. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Like, oh, I think God had to do something with my grandma. Actually, I know God had something to do with my grandma. But what about me? What about my story? That's something that's going on in Moses' life. It's something we see in this narrative. Moses needs something here. Moses needs revelation, communication from God. He needs an encounter with God. He needs God to, to show up and be particular to his story. He doesn't need God to be his grandma's God. Nothing wrong with grandma. But he needs God to be his God, personal to him. So that's what we're going to unpack today. Whether this God is a God who's spoken to you, a God who's encountered you, a God that you've spent time with, that spent time with you, or is this God just someone that you know of? A name that might be familiar, part of your family history book, but not part of your personal journals. We don't really know where Moses has been thus far with his faith, but maybe it's been something like this. Thinking about a concern for marginalized people but not so much the God that created them. Maybe being confused about some of the things that were more important than God to him. Am I safe in this wilderness? Am I going to find family? Am I going to find purpose? A story that maybe didn't really have God at the center. And I've been there too, thinking about concerns for justice and wondering, am I really concerned just about justice or this God thing that I know about? earlier in my story? Was God connected to this justice I cared about? I was thinking about comforts like stability, purpose in my life, where I was going, and those were the center. And I wondered, was God at the center of my story? Was it more the things I needed to feel good, to feel right about life? Even when I was cornered into a belief that I couldn't shake, I just felt like I I do believe in God. This is my God. I still wondered, Well, this is my God, but is this the God of my people? Has God really done things for my people in the lives of people that I care about? Or is this just a God that I have like a personal relationship with? I've wrestled with those things. I'm not sure if you have. And the thing that got me out of a funk each and every time was the work of revelation. God speaking to me, God encountering me, God becoming real in my life in that time and place, being so personal that I couldn't believe it. That happening in a dramatic way, sometimes, and other times, it was ordinary, as if God was walking with me. Not everything has to be as outlandish outlandish as the burning bush, but I think things can be just as arresting. 
a regular walk where you suddenly realize, I think God is here. I think God is with me. And I think that God might want to communicate with me. Maybe you felt that urge or that whisper. Maybe it's been your time in Scripture, realizing this ancient story somehow became way more personal to you, and you didn't know how. This is the work that's done by the Holy Spirit that helps connect us to God. It's the work that can make a burning bush, this crazy symbol we can read about in a story, to something that even if we haven't seen, you could be like, I might know how that felt like. I've had moments like that where you've been stuck, paralyzed, arrested by even a simple, small phrase by God. Even I love you. God's word can do that today. I think it's easy for us to feel sometimes too strange, too unique, too out there to have God, like the God, meet with you. But I think one of the encouragements in the story of Moses is that Moses is a pretty strange guy himself. And we can find some comfort being alongside him. That our ethnicity, like who we are, the things we've done, maybe even errors we've committed, sins we've committed, none of that makes us too far from God. But in fact, it sets up the stage for an encounter, for revelation. So let's pray for that today in our time. God, I pray right now that you would be present that you, God, would be meeting with us today, that you would be revealing yourself to us today. God, help us see you and know you. Help us hear your voice in all the ways that it appears. Help us know that we are not too strange, that we are not too out there, but that, God, you want to speak to us and that you will. I pray that would even happen today in the midst of the sermon, in the midst of our worship, in the midst of communion and taking in the elements and receiving prayer. God, would you be present with your word, living and active today in the name of Jesus. Amen. So today is going to be fairly simple. We'll look at five qualities of revelation as we walk through this text that's in Exodus 3. It's going to be just a few short, I think, 12 verses, and then just looking at different qualities of the revelation we see from God, hoping that will help us be in a posture to receive revelation again, even today, even as I speak, even for the things that you need in your life that connect with you. One of the stranger parts of the story is how it begins. Now, I've shared before that whether you're 16 or 66, your origin story matters, Partly because even if you've gone through it, remembering it and knowing the contours of your call can help direct you in your life when you move forward. But also because maybe you're in the thick of it, no matter what age you're in. Moses here, uh, the age that he is, it's not necessarily obvious from the passage, but he's around 80. Forty years have passed since he's gone to the wilderness to be in Midian. Uh, 80 is no spring chicken. You know, people can live longer, and they do. But 80s, like we got to say, we'd think that's not necessarily like where your origin story would conclude and you'd like set up for the next part of the journey. But it is, because our God sees things more than age. He sees what's going on in his people. He sees who he wants to use, and he uses whoever he wants to use, no matter their age. That's what our God does. This origin story, remember, the one that began before you were even born, that includes the work of resistance and rescue, seeds of conflict and call, oftentimes a wilderness experience. That wilderness experience for Moses was 40 years. I don't wish that on anyone. I don't want that for myself. I see some, like, you know, shakes in the room. Let's hope we don't have that. But isn't it encouraging that God's not done with Moses? God doesn't see him in the wilderness as a shepherd and say, you know what, let me just use someone else. God is consistent as someone that is passionately pursuing his people. Moses is a simple shepherd having an ordinary day until he is not. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Once again, we see Moses in his vocation as a shepherd. 
And I love the text. Like, it's like not just the wilderness, it's the far side of wilderness. I don't know what that is, but like, it's the far side, right? The text like, makes sure of that. And then I think Horeb, the mountain of God, it's not like this mountain is known as like the God mountain. I think it's what it becomes known as. So to Moses, it's just an ordinary place, again, until it's not. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the, bu- the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. This passage is amazing. Because what we see here is that there's one thing that Moses has to do to get this encounter, this revelation. And it's not be holy, it's not be perfect, it's not obey the law to the fullest. Remember, there's actually no law in terms of the Ten Commandments, that hasn't happened yet. And Moses is a murderer, so we know that he's, like, failed anyway. (laughs) It's not any of those things. It's not having the perfectly crafted, curated story. Like, when you fill that worksheet out, you know, like, I just know all my answers. It's not that. The only thing you need, according to this text, is the curiosity enough to investigate. And not just investigate anything, right, as if it's like, ooh, there's, like, some, like, small thing you wouldn't notice. It's investigate a burning bush. Like, that is what is needed here. The courage, the time maybe, and I think more than anything, the willingness to have the curiosity to explore the burning bush. It's an incredibly strange sight. And at this point, we've got to understand something, just kind of unpack what's happening. I think it's really beautiful in the text. It's a stranger in a strange land looking at what our text calls a strange sight. And somehow, in the midst of all that, God says, that's where I want to show up. I want to meet this stranger here, in my own strangeness, being a burning bush in this time. That's what God chooses to do. Seems like we have a weird God, right? So why does Moses get closer? Is it the sheer wonder? Maybe. But the bush right now hasn't talked. The bush is just burning. But in the burning, there's been no destruction. In the burning, the bush still stands. In the burning, there's a kind of purity where Moses sees a bush still, not something that's scorched, destroyed. Now, you've got to remember all the times in our text already, this is just like three chapters, but all the times where Moses has looked, where he's seen, where he's observed, where he's beheld, And what does he usually see? He only sees destruction. He sees something burnt up, whether literal or figurative, and it gets destroyed. But this is a time when Moses sees something burned, but nothing is being destroyed. There are strange things that have destruction at their core. The strangeness of men, women, and children enslaved and brutalized through slavery. The strangeness of a royal palace that acts like everything is okay. That every comfort afforded to them should be afforded to them. The strangeness that one day when an Egyptian beat a Hebrew, a sight that arrests Moses, that this Moses, this Egyptian Hebrew statesman, gets a heart somehow for his people and kind of instantly mishandles it. The strangeness of having to name your son a stranger in a strange land, just to remember, this place ain't home. To call your baby that. Because Moses can't go back because there's a hit on his life. He'd rather shepherd sheep in peace than to go back to this place that only means death. Now not just for his people corporately, but for himself individually. It's all strange and had destruction at its core. But now Moses stares at something just as strange powerful as fire, but it does not hurt the tree. And Moses considers it. He wonders about it. He's curious. This is a different power. It's a a different might. It's a different way. Egyptian power has never done anything like this. And Moses is compelled to get closer. Moses, Moses notices God in the midst of the wilderness. He notices destruction, 
but see something not being destroyed. And Moses gets curious. This is the first part of Revelation, being curious enough to investigate. God puts things in our ways that are sights to behold that contain new invitations that are paths for us. But we have to see them. We have to get close. We have to notice, even ask questions, to dare to go that step further. One of the phrases in the New Testament I love the most is, do we have eyes to see and ears to hear? And I don't think that's just because Jesus is saying, oh, I want them to like, be able to see and hear everything. I think ultimately it's so we encounter, so we move closer, so we get one step further. And then God says, with this one, I will show them many things. That's our first step of revelation. And do we notice that that power is so different than our own? That that power is so different than the ways of the world, than the destruction that usually lurks behind those machinations? So how are you doing being curious these days? Getting closer these days? Being willing to investigate these days? Whenever I think about this curiosity, I think about my own journey. Ways that, for me, I had to be challenged to know God personally, not just think about God intellectually. This involved a journey of looking at Scripture as a family storybook, something that I was good at at eight, but by the time I was in college, was not good at anymore. And I had to get back into a practice of noticing the things in the text that seemed like different forms of power, different ways of being, and then getting a little bit closer and saying, God, is this you? And can this be what my life is about? It also included the risk of letting people pray for me, often in the mode of listening and prophetic prayer. Somewhere I was like, no, 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 I don't want that. I don't want you to hear those things. and do, you know, I don't want that. But wait, that's like me assuming it's going to work. It's not, like, just stop. Like, don't, just don't do this. Don't get that close. But then I took a step closer in that. And I was blessed by people hearing from God on my behalf. Not using that power to hurt, to expose, but actually using that power to cover, to love, yeah. to see to give me purpose. It was specific words. They were moving me forward, not being an additional stumbling block. And lastly, I've had a journey with things like silence and stillness, the work of spiritual formation. And I've had to also get close to that, wondering, when I get quiet, am I just going to feel like my own anxiety about this thing? Am I just going to feel my boredom? And of course, am I going to feel my stomach, which of course, during like the spiritual formation moments, somehow, like is always the time it growls loudly, especially if there's other people in the room. <laughs> or would I be able to just relax and experience peace and see God again come in the form of silence and stillness, quiet, but just as arresting as other loud forms of God's speech. And almost every time I've reflected that I didn't do anything besides make myself available in a, in a small way, in a tiny way. But somehow, in that, I saw that God was active, full, all-consuming, like a fire that was already lit somehow, but somehow me taking a step closer revealed the flames. That's what it means for God to have our attention, for us to give God our curiosity, and to see how God reveals himself to us in that. When I do that, when I almost always lean into that, I almost always leave with some kind of gift, even if it's not what I was initially expecting. Moses, this possible nominal Israelite, does get closer, and the Lord notices him and continues the story. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. The second step is one where it's an invitation to deeper relationship through revelation. Moses gets closer, and what does the bush say? Moses! Moses! Somehow this bush, this God, knows his name. Think about like, how freaked out you would be. Like, what? Like, again, it's like already a burning bush, so I assume you'd be freaked out, but then like, now it knows your name. 
Exactly, right? <laughs> this is a unique moment. It's a powerful moment. It's a holy moment, a set-apart moment. God even instructs him, no, 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 no. Sandals aren't allowed here. You got to have bare feet. It's holy, holy. And I think this passage is really deep. But when I think about how often I remember it sometimes, maybe how it's popularized, it kind of can become just a little meet and greet between God and Moses. And I don't think that's how, like, we're intended to read this from the scripture. Kind of like, God's like, hey, like, I'm the bush. And Moses is like, okay, like, cool. Like, and then, like, somehow he just gets to Egypt. Right? Like, because this is a famous story. And we know what we do with famous things. Like, we don't look as closely, right? But when we see this story, we actually see something else. We see God leaning in just a little bit more, right? Like, going back a second, like, God's saying the name, and Moses is saying, here I am. But I think what happens next is pretty critical. They don't stay on a first name basis, right? God's like, since I'm God, and since you're you, and since we're meeting, we need to acknowledge this is holy. It's because I need to tell you some things. First, take off your sandals. Are you going to take that invitation? Yes. It's really a command. Because sometimes we just want God to know our name. We just want God to, like, see us and be like, oh, yeah, like, I know you. And we're like, yep, you do. Now I'm going to do, like, what I'm doing. And there's some <laughs> comfort in that, in, like, the living God knowing your name. But God's not just interested in knowing our name, like he, he already does, right? He's interested in inviting us deeper, inviting us further. And actually, sometimes those things, not just sometimes, a lot of times, they're going to involve commands, directions, directives. And are we interested in more than just that personal God, that personalized God? Maybe some things you can buy on certain websites, like, oh yeah, Josh, like, here's the thing, like, you're this person from God. Like, these kind of kitschy ways that we could think about knowing God. Or do we want to go deeper? Think about my relationship with my daughter at this point, who's 14 months we have a new thing we're learning to negotiate in the household. So uh, Zoe, she's wonderful, love her, T so does Tina. But she's learning a new thing where she's approaching the stairwell, and it's like at an alarming pace. And like she doesn't just go there, she used to do that, where she's like went to the stairwell, and then like went up the stairs, and we're like, oh, you can't do that. Now she's learned something interesting. I'm like, I want to know more about this. Like, what's going on? She looks back, and who's she looking at? Me or Tina? So she's like approaching the stairs, and then she's like, I'm like, oh, you know now. You know some things now. Because you know you're not supposed to do that. But she doesn't say anything. Well, she's a baby, right? But she's like, looks. I haven't said no. She hasn't, you know, not done it. But she just looks back. And then, like, she keeps going. And then, like, looks back again. I'm like, girl, you know what I'm going to do when you get to the stairs. I'm going to say, don't go up them. But then she just waits. Even getting to the first step and looking back again. I'm like, this is a girl that like loves that her dad knows her. That her dad knows her enough that she's looking back. We have a relationship. But is she doing what I want? Not at all. <laughs> now Zoe's 14 months. We're going to give her a pass. But I think oftentimes we're like that. We're like, oh, okay, he knows my name. So I'm going to keep going. Okay, he still knows my name. He's still there. Checking it. Okay, he's still, he's still there. But we're not doing the things God's calling us to do. And that's why God's like, actually, because this is holy, I need to know there's like a different set of rules. So like, take off your shoes, please, and I'll proceed. I'm going to go further, but can you, can you work with me here? That's the work of God. And here's the depth that God calls Moses to in this moment. When the Lord saw that he had gone, then God said, I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So first, right, the Lord's watching, the Lord's seeing, and the Lord's knowing. And when there's that relationship, God's like, okay, now I'm going to give you the goods. I'm going to share more with you. And the thing we learn here is that context matters. This isn't any old God of the mountain speaking. It's not any old God of the wilderness speaking, or even an Egyptian God for that matter. This is the God who knows Moses' daddy. He knows Abraham, the one who he's been in a covenant with. Isaac, his son. Jacob, 
the one whose name is Israel, who is the father of Joseph, the one who gave Egypt the blessing in the first place. This is that God, and that's the God who's talking to him. The one who brought the Egyptian people the blessings almost 500 years ago at this point in the narrative. And notice what's next here. A burning bush, for whatever reason, doesn't make Moses afraid. The burning bush, knowing his name, doesn't make him afraid. Taking off the sandals, still, no fear, at least as far as the narration says. But what makes him afraid? Oh, you know my story. You know my context. You know my dad. You know his people, who are my people. This is the work of Revelation as I've seen it, where God gets personal, but yet particular. It's not just fuzzy, like, I love you, although that's important, and God does say that, and that's been a way I think I've learned the voice of God. But oftentimes, God's gotten in my face a little bit and said, Josh, this is really how much I know you. Like, I know you got bullied. And I'm going to say that through people who didn't know. Like, I know that you're scared to lead. I'm going to tell it to people that didn't even know you were a pastor. I know that this is your context, that you care about your people. Black folk, you care. You love them. And they're hurting. And God's saying, I know. Corporate words, but tied uniquely to who I am. God wanting to speak to you, each of you, but also wanting to speak about your context. It's like God gets like a foot in, and it's like, we're going all the way. Like, all the way. Like, it's just not you. It's just not what you want. But it's what your people have wanted. It's what they fought for, maybe what they've died for, what they've done, shameful things that you wouldn't want to say. God wants to actually get in the midst of that narrative. And the question is, are we going to let him? Because sometimes we just want that first name basis again, right? We don't want the depths of what God has. Moses is afraid now. This is a God who's aware not just of generational successes, but also generational struggles, hard parts of our story. A God who's not just on a mission for you, but for your people, for your family. God knows the, more, the origin story of Moses' expansive didn't begin in Egypt, and it won't end there. And God's saying, let's talk more. I think, why is this so alarming to us? I think because it means that we can't hide anymore. And that even if we do hide, like that we try to hide, that we know, oh, God knows about the fullness of my story. God knows all those pieces I would love to reconcile in my story, but I don't know how yet. God knows about the brokenness of my family. And even if I don't know what he would do about it, he knows. And I know. And I know we both know. Like, what's going to happen here? No matter where we are in our cultural story, our ethnic story, God tells us we can't truly hide. God, this God knows that and is after us. God wants to give generational healing for that black person that's vowed never to watch any more slave movies. Just no, I don't care how many awards they win, I'm not watching them. God wants to give generational healing to that person. God wants to assure Asian Americans that God knows about generations that didn't worship God in his fullness, yet God still knows the names of those ancestors, every ancestor. God wants to convince the white person that there is a gift for them if they press into the hurt and the pain of confronting racism from generations past, both active and passive. Both had hurts, both secured lives. God wants to get into that narrative because he's God and he already knows and he wants to bring gifts and goodness even if we might feel that as painful at first. God has a gift for us no matter our ethnicity as he lets us, as we let him address our family and as we also let him connect that family to the family of God from our father, from our parent to Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob. With Moses afraid for the first time in this already supernatural and eerie exchange, 
God speaks finally to the longings that have been in Moses' heart, the longings about his people. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. God doesn't just know the generational pain that we're in. From this, we see that he feels it. He experiences it himself, and he has plans to rescue. He has plans to save and to serve. Moses finally hears his life call. He hears his mission. It's been present this whole time in origin story. Every talk we've shared, every scripture we've looked at, it's been present But in this moment, we see what we can see as kind of interested bystanders is now like a commission from the living God who knows Moses' name, but not just his name, his history. And here's how we get the call. So now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. He finally hears it. This particular call that's about the work Moses is meant to do in his life confirms what's been in his heart this whole time, but has never had the revelation, that understanding, oh, this is for me. This is what I'm going to do. This is your call for my life. But Moses has an important question from the wilderness in Midian with sheep all around. How? But Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you, that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Who am I to go? I will be the someone who goes with you. And what's the sign that it's really you? After you bring people out of Egypt, you'll worship on this mountain. Wait, so wait, God. The sign I'm going to do the thing you're asking me to do is that I'll have done it. (laughs) Yep, like that's it. So how again, God? Remember, I'll be with you. This is part of how revelation can go sometimes, where the important work has already happened. Like God's ready actually to peace out, which just means like staying around, but still like just like kind of peace in and be like, you got this now. And we're like, but wait, who, how, like how much money, what are we going to do? And God's like, just do it. Like, I've already told you. Like, actually, everything was said in that other verse. When he was like, so go and do this, that was God being like, I got you, there's provision, you're going to do it, it's going to happen. But then we ask all these questions, right? And the God's like, man, these questions again, just go. And you can worship if you want to, because, like, worship is great, and, like, you see, you know. But, like, really? The questions again? Okay. But God works with it. Because at the end of the day, God is a God that always wants to reveal promise and hope. It's a promise of a presence. I will be with you. How? I'm there. How am I going to do this? I'm right there. But how, when? I'm here. Like, that's just what God does. And the way that's important to us, significant to us, is because we feel it. We can know it. We can sense it. God can be real to us. If you're just reading an ancient text that says God's here for you, or maybe like a present Hallmark card that says that, I'm not sure if we should be so encouraged, although it's fine if we are. But when God speaks in the quiet or in the stillness or through a friend or through scripture, and you know, you know that you know that you know, that means something. God's in that. God's with us. God's confirming a call. And the call already contains a promise. Go and do this thing. Go and do it. I'm going to be with you through the whole thing. The same way that you drew near to me to hear my voice. I'm committed to being just as near. You took one step, and I'm with you all the way now. That step was it. You saw a burning bush, and you came forward. You let me say my, your name over you. But not just that, you took a command and an instruction, and you let me say more about how your name is connected to all these other names. And I'm choosing you to be the one to, that knows that you'll be connected to your people through this God of generations. 
This is God's revelation to Moses. And it's crazy if we think about it. Forty years later in the wilderness, with sheep all around, God chose Moses, a murderer, to deliver his people. In one swift move, God honors the resistance of the midwives. God affirms the rescue that Moses received early in life and says, yes, not only have you rescued, but you are a rescuer. That call that was clanging around Moses' life all along finally resounds because it joins the revelation of God. It's no longer Moses' call alone, Moses' desire alone, Moses' burning passion alone, as if that will do anything. But it's connected with a living God that said yes and amen. Go, do this, and I'm with you. That's what Moses has needed. Now in the presence of a living God, his call fits in a way it just didn't in the wilderness as a shepherd in a way it didn't really when he was on the run, in a way that definitely didn't when he killed the Egyptian, when he was just waiting. But now there's a way the call fits in a certain way because of God's revelation. This is crucial. It's an invitation for us. I'm just going to share uh, one more story and do a few invitations and go to communion. This story is part of my story. It's a story that comes from who I am as a black person descended from enslaved people who I believe God freed. It's a story of a time when I was a senior in college and I got an incredible opportunity, but it was still an opportunity that terrified me. I was in a class called the Literature of the Middle Passage. And as part of that class, we too would take this transatlantic journey. We would go to Ghana. We would see places we would encounter stories about slavery. This is the first time I'd ever been to Africa, West Africa, to Ghana. And I realized this is gonna get close for me. And in the class, uh, they picked an assortment of folks. There happened to be three black folk they picked. There was one, (laughs) Abby already knows what's coming. Uh, There was one that was from the continent. She was Ethiopian. There's one who was Dominican, had the Caribbean identity, and there was me. Mike, it's like, just check, check, check. We got them all. This is Yale. We're good. We're going to go. And so I'm like, oh, shoot. Like, like with my two you know, family members are here, we're going to have a lot of weight on us. But I think me in particular, I'm going to have a lot of weight on me. So how's everyone experiencing this trip, Josh? <laughs> we're calling on you now. And for some reason... This professor always had some questions about faith, and Christianity in particular. Like, right questions about Christianity's role in all of this, where it was in all of this. And part of what this professor loved to reveal was eventually something I saw when I was in Elmina, the slave castle, which is this. In the middle of everything, a church. Right in the center. A church where they praised God, prayed to God told stories of God. And this professor was like, ooh, I can't wait to ask a question to Josh tonight. At least that's what I think he did. So when I was there, I kind of knew what was coming. And I had to ask God, God, what are you doing here? I think it might have been the night before where uh, that professor asked, like, so what do you think is, like, different about you? Like, the fact that, like, you have this story. Is it just, like, in your blood? I'm like, wait, can a professor say these things? Like, do you think that's, like, why you have this narrative, why you're different? Like, well, it's my story. Like, it's actually what happened to my people. Like, I care about it. Like, I think God cares about it, too. And as I walked around Elmina, especially at the level of the church, my spirit was just sunk. Because I realized the professor can be a certain kind of way, but he's not lying. Like, this is history, too, looking at this church. But then I did something. I got a little bit of elevation. I went higher up, and I saw the water. The water that represents a treacherous journey, but the water that also represents the fact that some of us made it. That I was back again, on the other side again. Years later, Decades later, centuries later, I had somehow made it back. And it wasn't by happenstance. It wasn't just random. But the God who freed my people, the God who was with them in slavery, was with them in the wilderness, all of a sudden had brought me back to look, to see, to behold. 
to start a conversation and say, Josh, do you know what I've done for your people? Looking above the castle, above the church, into the sky, into the water, I could see something that that church would never teach me. It said that God had freed my people. And it didn't matter if that particular church had nothing to do with it. But that moment wasn't over. On the last night of the trip, we were able to kind of go out one last time. Uh, I think it was like some bar, pub situation. But it was right by the ocean. So the Atlantic was there once again. And we kind of got time to say, like, here's when you need to be back. And I was like, I'm going straight to the water. I went down the rocks. I went on the last one I could go to before just being in the water. I got down, seated, put my hands out in a prayer posture I now use all the time. I didn't really know the significance of then. I just said, God, thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for being with my people. Thank you for saving them, for saving the line that I belong to. And as I closed my eyes and heard the water, I felt something I can't explain I don't know how, but I just felt like someone was clasping my hands. Like someone was holding them. As if they were saying, I'm with you. I know you. And you're going to go back to the other side, but I'm going to be with you then. But I have things for you to do. I didn't know at all what those were. But the thing that mattered more than the things to do was the presence I know now is the work of the Holy Spirit comforting me, comforting the people I belong to. Same motion, just a few centuries removed. But God was there then and he's there now. I don't know your particular story. I don't know where this is personal to you. I don't know when you look back at generations, if you see that as a welcome sight or if you get frustrated, I don't know. I'd love to talk to you about it, but I don't know. But I know God is at work in your story, and I know there's healing for you. I know there's blessings for you. I know there's something worth it in looking back at a long story of God's movement. Because God's work of healing isn't just about your life. If it was, God would be far too small. But God's work is about your generations. And if you can't see that because of discomfort, if you can't see that because you don't want to look back at horrible things that your people have done, then you're missing out. Not just on an opportunity to repent and to say, Lord, use me. Use me anew and afresh. But you're missing out on knowing who God is and how big God is in your story and understanding Scripture in a whole new way, seen as this family storybook that we belong to. I don't know your particular story, but God does. God wants to meet you today and reveal himself to you. Quick invitations. The worship team can come up. There's a prayer in the epistles that says, Spirit of wisdom and revelation, come into my life. We can ask for that prayer, that spirit of wisdom and revelation, even now. Like I said, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't think Moses had like, the access uh, to know all about this that we do. We're in a different place and we can be in a different posture. To ask the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to us. We can step into moments of difficulty or wilderness, generational pain, and say, Holy Spirit, can you give me your spirit of wisdom and revelation to know that can be your step forward. Examining for calling is particular and contextual. When you think about what you're meant to do, when you think about the things that give you life, the things that give you purpose, is it particular to you? Like, is your context involved? If it's not... I wonder if it's too small. That's not a knock. It's actually just a greater invitation. How is your call, your work, God's purpose connected to the healing work that needs to be done in your people and all people? And lastly, find folks like Moses and tell the story. I'm so struck that Moses enters into this passage as someone that's just a nominal follower of God, follower of the way, but isn't really a worshiper of God, isn't someone who really knows God. I think there's Moseses all around the city. People have 
callings on their life, people that are so close to the kingdom and to God, but they don't know the fullness of the story. And you might, or you just heard this talk, and you can say, can I share the story with you? Can I talk to you about this guy named Moses? Can I talk to you about your deeper call in life? Can you connect some dots? Can you be someone that can be a translator? You're not the savior. You're not the rescuer. But you can translate stories. You can know the depths to which they go and help other people connect to this God. We're going to respond now through worship and through communion. In communion, we're acknowledging that there's a center to this story that Moses didn't have the advantage of knowing. It's the center of the person of Jesus who became particular as a human being, particular as a Jewish man, particular as someone who lived in Palestine, oppressed. And this person decided to love, to love so hard that it was his very love that got him killed. To love in a way that would bring people back to who God really was. To know that it didn't matter if you were Jew or Gentile, but that you were welcome, that you were seen. And that love that Jesus had cost him his life. But somehow, in dying, there's still newness. Somehow, in dying, there's still further life. Somehow, in dying, we can connect our story. Scripture calls it being grafted in, being connected to this brother of Jesus and connecting our story to his. That's the ultimate work of any origin story, is to be connected to this Jesus that gives life. So when we take bread, the body of Christ, and dip it into the cup, the blood of Jesus that was shed for us, we're saying yes again to being crafted into this story that has cost, but costs that still lead to life and life eternal. I'm going to ask the communion servers to come up. I'm going to pray for us. Holy Spirit, would you come? Holy Spirit, would you come and reveal yourself? I don't know what each person here needs, but I'm praying, God, for a breakthrough. For you to speak into the silences, that you would speak into the chaos, that you would speak into even resistance, that your speech, God, would win today. So Holy Spirit, would you just activate all the things that we need inside of us. The spirit of wisdom and revelation, understanding, patience, even prophecy, God, to know you and what you're doing in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.